So we are continuing in a series of messages looking at the tabernacle. And we've been in the book of Exodus now for um, seven years. No, no, <laughs> really just since January. Um, but some of you are like, yeah, it feels like seven years. Um, what we've been doing is walking slowly through this book and picking up what it is that God is dropping. There's so many things that we can learn about our Heavenly Father and about what it means to be His people. And, and that's why we've been walking so slowly through this. What I want you to understand is that this, this section that we're in now, the section dealing with the tabernacle, is really all about the theology of the worship of God. How do you worship your Heavenly Father? What does it look like and why does it matter? Does it matter how we do it? Or is any way okay? Can you just, you know, Bebop and scat into the presence of God and say, hey, big guy, how you doing? Is, is that okay? Is there a, is there a way, a method, a, a process? This is what we're learning about. And so what I want to do today is continue the study where we left off last week. We're going to be in chapter 30. If you want to power on or turn in your Bible, you can do that. We'll have it up on the screens as well. But what I want you to understand as we continue in the tabernacle is to understand that the tabernacle is the place where heaven and earth intersect. This is the place where God has said, I will come and dwell in the midst of my people, quite literally. Because as we've talked about, the tabernacle, whenever they set it up, it's a portable worship environment. Whenever they move, they set it up, and then the tribes set up around it. Three to the north, three to the south, three to the east, three to the west. So God is literally in their midst, and what they are learning about is what that means for, for God to be with them and for them to be the people of God. How do you do that? This is the place where heaven and earth intersect. I've been using throughout this section of the, of the Exodus series pictures from a replica of the tabernacle that is actually in southern Israel. Uh, and so this is a, a picture of that replica. Uh, is this exactly what it looked like in every detail? Probably not, right? But it's close. The, the detail given in the text, while it seems overwhelming to us at times, uh, is not enough to make an accurate reconstruction in every detail. But this is close. This gives you a good approximation of what this looks like. It's in the middle of the desert, uh, much like they would have set up. So as we walk through, I'll show you pictures from this to give you a sense or an idea of what we're talking about and what we're looking at. Let's start in chapter 30. Let's start in verse 1. You shall make an altar, God said, on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. Now, we've already seen an altar, right? The altar of burnt offering, the big, big grill, basically, in the courtyard, right? I mean, seven and a half foot by seven and a half foot by four and a half foot high. That, my friends, is a grill. You put the animal up there and you cook it, everybody's going to know it. This is a different altar. This is an altar on which you're going to burn incense. Now, now what, is, what is incense? What's that for? And we're going to see this is a picture what is it a picture of? Wait for it. Looking at the, the altar of incense, a cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. Remember what we said a cubit was? About a foot and a half. Technically, a cubit is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. That's a cubit, technically. You might be thinking, yeah, but... That might be different for you than for me. Yeah. It's not standardized. It's not complicated at all, really, is it? For us, it's about 18 inches. So, how big is this altar? About a foot and a half wide, a foot and a half long, and two cubits high. It's about three feet, about three feet high. This is much smaller than the other altar. So, get, a, get an idea of the scale. Now, what does it look like? You're going to overlay it with pure gold. It's top and around its sides and its horns, and you shall make a molding of horn around it. We've talked about the horns on the altar of burnt offering out in the courtyard. What, is the, what are the horns for? Right, to hold the animal, to tie down the animal. That's the point of the horns. Later on, those horns would symbolize refuge. So if you were trying to escape somebody who's trying to pursue you, you could grab onto the horns of the altar, and it's a way of asking for mercy. This altar is not going to have a sacrifice on it like that, yet it still has horns. Why is that? We'll get there. 
You shall make two golden rings for it under its molding on two opposite sides of it. You shall make them, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. Remember, this all has to be portable because wherever they go, they're going to tear it down, they're going to move, they're going to set it up. Then it's time to move again. They're going to tear it down. They're going to move, and they're going to set it up again. Everything has to be portable. So you've got lots of rings and poles and things you're going to use to carry it with. This is consistent for all of these articles. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and then overlay them with gold. And you shall put it, where's this altar going to be? In front of the veil that is above the Ark of the Testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony, where I will meet with you. So where's this going? This is going inside the tent, inside the tabernacle itself, the proper, all the way in the back, right next to the veil that is in front of the Ark of the Covenant. It's as close to the presence of God as it can possibly be without going beyond the veil. Hmm. And Aaron, the high priest, the first high priest, shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. God said, you shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a burnt offering or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Do this exactly like God says. Do not try to get creative here. Do this the way God said it. Now, much later, right, We're going to see a couple of Aaron's sons try to get creative and step outside of the bounds on this. And it does not end well for them. You can find this in Leviticus. God says, clearly, from the beginning, do it exactly like I'm telling you to do it. Aaron, the high priest, shall make atonement on its horns once a year. That's on the Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest gets to go in there. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he shall make atonement for it once in the year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. This altar of incense is as close to the presence of God as anything except for the Ark of the Covenant itself, which is called the mercy seat. Now, this is the replica. This is inside the tabernacle tent. And you can see here in the back, right in front of the veil, the altar of incense. Right? About three feet high, about a foot and a half by a foot and a half A little bit closer, you can see here, and you see the poles, the rings, and you see the horns. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would put blood on the horns, symbolizing the atonement that he's making for on behalf of the people. He's making a sacrifice on behalf of the people coming into the presence of God. But this, you would offer incense on twice a day, every morning and every night, every morning and every night, every morning and every night, always. Now, it starts with just the high priest, but later... Any of the priests could do it, but there were too many of them. And so by the time of Jesus' day, there are so many priests, they have to pick and choose who's going to get to offer the incense. So they would cast lots. We've talked about that before. It's a way of choosing. And and they would cast lots. And and one day, this guy named Zechariah gets called, and it's the first time in his life he's ever been called to do this, and he's an old man. And and he's so excited because he gets to go in and offer the incense. And he goes in. And something very unexpected happens. He and his wife are are old, way past childbearing years. And a messenger from God shows up and says, hey, God's heard your prayers. And I'm thinking, Zachariah's like, you mean my prayers from like 30 years ago? Because like, we're we're a little beyond that now. (laughs) You're going to have a son. And his name will be John. And this is who we know as John the baptizer in the New Testament. What's Zechariah doing? He's going and he's offering incense on this altar. It's not in the tabernacle. By this time, they had set it up permanently in Jerusalem in the temple. But it's at the altar of incense. That's what's happening here. This is a top view you can see there. So the question that I think we have to look at here is, is what is the what is the point of this? Why do we care about this incense? What is the purpose of it? You burn incense on it, right? You put it in there and you, you, you set it at the, the flames and then it's burning and the smoke. You're inside of a tent. Do you really want a lot of smoke? You really want open flames? Like, not exactly what I'm after. So what's, what's going on here? It's kept at a low simmer. This isn't just like a roaring fire. The incense is burning. The, 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 the smoke is rising. The incense is rising up. 
And I want you to imagine that, that they see the Ark of the Covenant as the mercy seat. This is the, the, the symbolic throne of God's presence in his people, with his people. And so in front of God's presence, in front of his throne, so to speak, this incense rises every morning and every night, every morning and every night, over and over and over again. The incense rises before God twice every day, symbolizing the continual prayers of his people rising up before him. And it's a visual. They see it, smell it. Every morning, every night, every morning, every night. Because God is always listening to the voices of his people. He's always listening to the prayers of his people. This is what the altar of incense is for. That's its purpose. But guess what? We don't stop there. The Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. You're going to take a census. You're going to count the people. But when you do, they shall each give a ransom. Other translations will say they must redeem. They must be redeemed. They must be paid for. Hmm. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 giraz, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel. When you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that is the tabernacle, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. Well, what is this about? Why do you have to be paid for? Why does everybody have to be paid for? What does that matter? This goes back to an idea that we will see fleshed out in, in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy through the rest of the books of the Pentateuch or the Law of Moses. What you see here is this idea that every life matters and every life belongs to God ultimately. And every life, in order to be atoned for, must be redeemed, must be paid for. And so what they are doing is they are redeeming themselves to God. They, hey, we're going to take this and we're going to do this. This is a symbolic act that we're going to do to pay for my life. You've given me life. I'm going to show my gratitude. I'm going to redeem it. This is a, a very foreign concept to us. But in this day and time, very common, made perfect sense. They would redeem the firstborn, always. This was a very special thing. The firstborn of an animal, the firstborn of a pe of people. Firstborn redemption was even more special, but every person here is redeemed. But note, nobody pays more or less. The rich pay no more, the poor pay no less. Everybody pays the half shekel. Why is that? A lot of opinions on this. Here's mine. I think God is teaching the people. This is something that God has been doing throughout our study of Exodus. He has been teaching the people. Imagine you've got a group of people who have been enslaved for hundreds of years. What is their mindset? Their mindset is what they have lived. Your mindset comes from your experience, unless you're intentional about changing it. Your mindset comes from your experience. Their experience has been they have lived in slavery for hundreds of years, and God wants to teach them something new. Remember, Exodus is not just about rescuing a people from slavery. It's about rescuing them to freedom. Freedom to worship him. Freedom to be his people and live as his people. This isn't just about freedom from slavery. This is about something much bigger than that. But in order for that to work, they have to change how they think. They have to change their mindset. Thus far, they have lived in a society in Egypt that was very hierarchical. Think about it. Do you think Pharaoh got treated the same as the slaves? Not so much. You think Pharaoh's court got treated the same as Pharaoh? It was a hierarchy. And different people received different benefits based on their stage and their station in society. This was how it worked. And if you were at the bottom, everybody stepped on you. And this is what they were used to. God is teaching them something different. 
He's teaching them that you matter, every one of you. And what you have, some of you have more than some of the rest of you, but what you have does not buy atonement for you. None of you have enough to do that. This is a symbolic thing. What you have does not buy your atonement before God. No way, no how. Atonement, remember, is being at one, at one meant, at one with your heavenly father. You can't buy that, no matter how much you have. I remember this was about six months before we moved here. I was still serving at a church in Texas, and I was reading in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram one day about a guy named Warren Buffett. Anybody heard of this guy? Yeah, this is, this is back in 2000, early 2004. And Warren Buffett had just made a, a, just a, a massive gift. I want to say it was something like $38 billion uh, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I mean, it was, I, I have no concept of numbers like that. And, and he, he makes this gift, and they do a press conference, a big deal, you know, balloons. And the, probably not balloons, but I'm thinking it should be balloons because balloons make everything happier. And, and, and he's, he's talking and, and, and answering questions, and he said something that I will never forget as long as I live. And if you've been around here a while, you may have heard me talk about this. He said, there are a lot of ways to get to heaven, but this is a pretty good one. I will never forget that statement. What is he saying? He's reflecting this idea that what you have buys atonement for you. That you can buy your at-one-ness with your heavenly father. And God is teaching the people of, of Israel back here in Exodus, back here at the beginning in their origin story. He is telling them and teaching them so that they understand you can't do that. You can't buy, you don't have enough. I don't care how much you have. If you're sitting here and you have $38 billion, you don't have enough. God wants to teach them something different than they have ever heard in their entire life. He wants to teach them that every life is of equal worth before God. Every single one. No exceptions to that. You have never locked eyes with anyone who isn't of equal worth before your heavenly Father is you. We haven't always gotten that right, have we? Historically, all we have to do is look back through the pages of history and we can see we haven't always gotten that right. And sadly, we haven't always gotten that right in the church. We have no excuse for that. But we can make it right going forward, can't we? This is what what God says. Every life is of equal worth before him. He wants them to understand that because they have the mindset that they are not worth as much as. They are not as good as, because that's what slavery does to you. And God wants to teach them something better. He wants to teach them something greater. All of them. Now, you might note that it didn't say just the guys. Because the guys aren't any more valuable than the girls. Amen. Sometimes I'll amen myself because you don't do it. So I'm just going to tell you. Every life is of equal worth before God. The young and the aged are of equal worth before God. Every race, tribe, tongue, language, socioeconomic status. This isn't just a sentence of Abraham in the room here. Remember, there are people who came out from Egypt with them who were not Jews. They were not people of Israel. Every life is of equal worth before God. I hope if you hear nothing else so far, you hear this. Because this will change your life. This is what I think God's trying to teach them. He wants them to understand that every one of you is going to bring the same thing because every one of you is worth same to your heavenly father. Way more than a half shekel, by the way. That's just a symbol. And it also creates a sense of unity among the people. Everybody brings the same. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, everybody brings the same. Everybody brings the half shekel. We, we have in our country, the same as, as many other countries, we have a, a progressive tax where if you make more, you pay more percentage-wise, right? If you make less, you pay less percentage-wise. 
And that works really well to create unity and oneness among people. <laughs> right? There's never any resentment or bitterness around that at all, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> The, the Robin Hood effect of taking from the race to give to the poor, who does that make happy? No one. Ultimately, no one. Every life is of equal worth before God. Everybody, no matter where you've been, what you've done, everybody brings the half shekel so that you don't forget this. This is a teaching opportunity. God is using every tool in his tool bag to teach the people that you are not what you were. You are not where you were. This is better. As we said last week, you are chosen. You are priests. You are a holy people. And you are my people. I picked you on purpose. <sighs> that will blow your mind. The Lord then said to Moses, You shall also make a basin of bronze, with its stand of bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations." So this is just basically a big water basin. And the priests would come and they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet. Because cleanliness matters. You want to walk into the presence of God filthy? Not so much. Not a good plan. You've got to be clean. You've got to be clean holy. This is why we've talked so much about holiness through the series. To be set apart. To be made holy in the presence of God, because only holiness enters into the presence of God. This basin is a reminder to the people every time they, the priests are going to serve, they have to wash. And not just their hands, but their feet too. When we went over the priest's garments last week, you might have noticed they don't have any footwear. There's no shoes. Why? Remember what God said to Moses way back in Exodus 3, and this has been a few months, way back in Exodus 3, when God talks to Moses and on, on the side of Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and there's this burning bush that's not consumed. Remember what the first thing God said to Moses is? Take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. The priests don't wear shoes here when they're serving in the tabernacle. Why? Because they're standing on holy ground. This is where God dwells in his people. This is where heaven meets earth. There's the basin there, the bronze basin. Some translations call it a bronze laver, which I was talking to Charlotte about this morning. It comes from the French word, means to wash. It's this basin. And it's a reminder of how important cleanliness is when you're serving your heavenly Father. The Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet-smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is 250, and 250 of aromatic cane, and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand. You shall consecrate them. Remember, this word means to set it apart for a specific purpose, to make it holy, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. God is teaching the people the importance of this distinction between what is normal every day and what is sacred or what is holy. There is to be a distinction here. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. There are no fakes. There are no duplicates or knockoffs on eBay, right? You cannot do that with this. You cannot make something that is even close to it or else you'd be cut off. 
What does cut off mean? It means you get kicked out. You don't get to live in the camp anymore. You're not a part of the people. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stactia and ankia and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be an equal part and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to the Lord. Again, don't make this for your own home. This is only for the tabernacle. Whoever makes any like, whoever makes any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from his people. Don't do that. This is the end of the chapter. And this anointing oil and this incense have a very specific purpose. The incense, obviously, we've talked about with the altar of incense. It symbolizes the prayers of God's people going up before him. But this anointing oil is, is interesting to me. It's something that was very common in use in this day. You would anoint people. You would anoint priests. You would anoint kings or leaders. You would anoint holy places, holy utensils like these things, like the altars and the, the lampstand to set it apart as holy. But what exactly is this about? There's something, there's an element here that I think is helpful for us. We've talked about the importance of being clean when you come into the presence of God, hence the basin. You got to clean. Wash your hands, wash your feet, probably wash your face too. You know, you want to be clean when you come into the presence of God. Cleanness matters. I really, really like how this Old Testament scholar named Doug Stewart puts this. He says, anointing is related to cleanness and purity as symbols of holiness. God demanded that his priests, the servants of his house, be clean and pure. Makes sense. But lice were endemic in biblical times. And to be lousy was hardly to be clean and pure. The solution was the regular use of oil, which kills lice. Why did the priests use anointing oil regularly? To be clean. So that they're not lousy. I mean, that's pretty practical. But it makes a lot of sense. And so much of what we read about in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy are like this. When you dig into it and you start to pull it, you're like, oh, that's why God did that. Oh, now I understand. Oh. This section of the tabernacle We've, we've touched on so many different pieces and elements here, and, and they're all important in their own way, but I, I really want to zero in on that redemption, the price you pay for your redemption, the half shekel. I want to zero in as we land today because I think this is so, so important. And I'm not the only one who wants to zero in here. There's a guy named Peter who walked with Jesus, one of the, one of the 12 disciples. And Peter later would be writing to followers of Jesus in the first century. And he said something that I think ties directly into this because he's using a, an, an image from this section of Exodus dealing with this price that you pay for your redemption. He's writing to followers of Jesus and he says, therefore, preparing your minds for action, preparing your minds, changing your mindset, by the way, something that's going on here in Exodus, God's rewiring their mindset, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Have we looked at holiness at all? Just a wee bit? Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed or redeemed or paid for from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold or a half shekel, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. This is what I want you to hear. This is what I want you to know. You have a heavenly father who sees so much value in you 
who loves you so much, who has declared that you are worth ransoming, you are worth redeeming, you are worth paying for. And he did that. And this isn't something that you have to repeat regularly like the people of Israel did, bringing their half shekel every time they did a census. No, no, no. The writer of Hebrews we've already talked about in this series says that this was done once and for all because of Jesus Christ. His blood ransomed you. His sacrifice paid for you. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus redeemed you. He paid for you. You don't have to bring a half shekel in when you come into the presence of God. You don't have to redeem yourself because, by the way, you can't. Not even if you have $38 billion. There is one who can pay for you. There is one who can redeem you. The one who has declared you are worth it. You are loved. You are valued. And that's Jesus. I want you to know that. I want you to hear that. But more than that, I want that to soak so deeply inside of you that it changes not only how you look at yourself, but it changes how you look at other people. Because we have a Heavenly Father who looks at every person He created with no exceptions and sees value and worth. He loves every single one. And sometimes that's easier to agree with for somebody else than it is for you. Yeah, you know, I, I know God loves everybody and he loves all the people and everything. Yeah, but, but I, and we want to put a but in there. But I, but, but I did, but I thought, but I was. And you know what God does? He pays for it. Whatever your but is. We did a series a few years ago. You can catch it on the app if you want to go back. How big is your butt? Some people have bigger butts than others. For some people, that butt is like, yeah, but, but I, but I, but I, I, I was, I was this, but yeah, but I failed, but I, I couldn't even hold that together. I couldn't even, and we want to, we want to throw all these butts in there. When this statement has no buts, Jesus redeemed you. He paid for you. All of it, past, present, future, knowing everything about you, everything you've ever thought, said, or done. He loves you. He says you have value. You have worth. He paid the price. And our response to that is, is simple. We can either choose to accept it or we can continue trying to create worth and value ourselves. Pay in our own way, so to speak. That never works. It never has and it never will. So my challenge for you is simple. Let the one who created you pay for you. Receive that. Accept it. Say yes to the gift your heavenly father is offering you. And then live in that freedom. Freedom. Quit trying to strive and do more, do more, do more, do more and try to earn your way into God's favor. You can't do it. You can't earn grace. That's why it's called grace. This is my challenge. And for some, I know it is harder to do that looking at yourself than it is about anybody else. And for some, it's hard to look at other people who might not be like you. Okay. Go back to what Scripture says. What does scripture say? Every life matters. Every life is of equal value. Bar none. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray this would soak so deeply down inside of each one of us that we would never forget it. That it wouldn't just be information that we know now. but that we would allow this truth to change our hearts, our minds, and our behavior. Change the words that we speak to one another. Change the words that we speak to ourselves in our own self-narrative, in our own self-dialogue. 
you have declared. Every person you made has value. Every person has worth. Every person is loved. You know everywhere we've been, you know everything we've done. And you declare that to be true. We are loved. We are chosen. We are redeemed. When we choose to accept that gift, we find freedom. We find life with you, not apart from you. And I pray for every person who is listening to this. That they would say yes. Yes to the gift of freedom. Not freedom from something, but freedom to something. Freedom to life with you. That's the starting line. I pray this for every one of us today in the name of Jesus.